So my name is Blaine Smith, uh, staff software engineer at Rocket Science, and today we're going to be covering capturing NIC and kernel TX and RX timestamps for packets in Go. Um, as I said, my name is Blaine Smith, I uh, work at Rocket Science. I've been doing uh, online game services for AAA game studios for about 10 years. So uh, companies like Unity, Warner Brothers, Among Us, uh, things like that, mostly focusing on uh, their backend systems like uh, matchmaking, leaderboards, authentication systems, um, and uh, game networking itself. Um, been spending most of my time in like low level networking space and distributed systems and in my free time doing some competitive powerlifting and, and strongman work. A um, little bit about rocket science itself. Uh, we specialize in multiplayer games, um, uh, working with companies like Unity, PUBG, Multiplay, Vivox. Um, those are mainly geared towards the distributed system space, um, game servers, um, live chat, uh, things of that nature. A um, uh, few examples of the games that we worked on are things like Rocket League, League of Legends, Doom, um, and even some guitar here in the past as well. Um, so what we want to really dig into today is the three basic measurements on how we want to measure a connection between two computers in a network. Um, we have the latency, which is when a packet moves from A to B, the jitter, the variation of latency over that over a given time frame, and the packet loss, which is the you know, percentage of packets that were potentially lost over the uh, over a given time frame. Um, an example you can see is everybody used the ping program in the past. So if we ping a certain location on the internet, we we can measure the time it takes for a packet to go from our machine out to that destination. And then once we cancel this, we can see how many packets were transmitted, how many were lost, and what the, the total time was. And we get the standard deviation and you know, averages across the, uh, the latency. Um, and this is a pretty standard way to get uh, measurements. And it's important for some of our, our game servers um, to understand where players are so they can stand up um, game servers in the right geographical location for their players. Um, doing a, a similar ping in Go would be used in this popular ping package. Um, so this yields us the, the same results just in a programmatic fashion, um, setting up a pinger to the same endpoint, running the pinger for uh, three rounds, and then collecting the statistics at the end. And we can use those statistics to do uh, anything we want. Um, we also like to collect measurements in uh, HTTP servers. So if we have a basic handler like this, we can curl an endpoint and we can print out the time that we get that request at the handler. Um, similar fashion, we can do the same thing with the TCP server, logging out the timestamp that we receive a particular connection and a particular packet. And again, for completeness uh, in UDP land as well, we can listen for a packet, read the data, and get the timestamp when we get a packet in from the, the source. But the problem with that is uh, every time we use a TCP con read write or a UDP read from write to, our Go process itself, because, it's had its own, because it has its own runtime, makes the Linux system call to send and receive via the kernel. Um, and that kernel then puts that data on the NIC queue, and then it's actually eventually gets sent out to the wire itself. Um, these system calls and these queues all take time. Um, where our Go program runs is at the top layer in user space. But then the two layers below, our packets actually spend some amount of time in before it's actually transmitted over the wire to the destination server that we're sending our data to. You know, a sample ping sequence here from the previous slides was if we take a timestamp in user space on the top left and we send it to the kernel, is that green arrow? Uh, the kernel then puts it on the transaction queue and then the NIC finally puts it over the wire and then the reverse happens um, on computer B to come out the other side. And so what we end up with is this latency from the RX time 
minus the TX time in user space is that's the full latency forward and back. Um, this includes the kernel time, the green arrows on both computer A and computer B, um, and then also the, the NIC queues in blue, which are those transaction, those TX and RX buffers. Um, but what if we want just the orange line from NIC to NIC, and we don't want to actually account for um, all the times above? Um, we could leverage control messages in the Linux kernel that will send us messages back up to user space when packets hit the certain layers in the kernel and on the NIC. Um, so we can get the kernel outgoing time uh, when the packs that make it from the, makes it from the kernel to user space. And then we can get the NIC outgoing time when the packet actually gets placed onto the wire if the actual network card supports uh, time stamping the packet itself. Um, and then the same is true for the reverse. We can get the time when a packet actually hits the network card in from the wire. And then again, when the kernel uh, sends it up into user space. Um, in order to do this, we need to uh, throw away the usage of the standard library, uh, TCP and UDP sockets in Go, and we have to go a little bit deeper um, and leverage the uh, AF packet socket type in Linux, um, which requires us to manually construct every layer of our packet manually. Uh, fortunately, there's a great socket library out there that makes working with this lower level socket pretty idiomatic and comfortable if you're familiar with Go. Um, it implements the um, UD, uh, UDP uh, packet con uh, interface. So this should be pretty familiar to you. Um, like I said before, you have to manually construct these byte slices for the packets that you want to send. Um, there's a very handy package by Google called GoPacket. Um, and there's a quick example so it shows you building up every single layer of a packet until you get to layer four, which is traditionally what you're familiar with when you're sending and receiving data with a TCP or UDP connection in Go. Um, so you would build up all these layers itself, serialize the whole packet, and then finally, at the very end, do a socket.write to send the, the packet out. Um, additionally, with the control messages that we're allowed to listen for is the uh, the SO timestamping control message. Um, the SO stands for socket option, uh, which might be pretty familiar for folks in, uh, in C. Um, so these control messages provide extra information that the Linux kernel will give you about the socket. Um, and one of those socket options is for actually getting timestamp information for packets going in and coming out. Um, and that link to the documentation on the full coverage there, but the, the basic gist below is when you're receiving uh, a message you can receive from the RX queue, you're just doing a normal connection read, um, you'll receive the actual data packet and you'll also get the control message too, which will contain the, the NIC time and the kernel time that that packet hit at each stage. Um, for packets outgoing, um, you have to listen and do another receive, but in this sense, you have to receive on the error queue because the kernel will replay back the packet that you sent out back on the error queue so that you can basically receive a packet that you sent out uh, in a loopback fashion to get the original packet and the control message. So it will tell you when um, that packet hit the kernel and the network card going out. Um, and then all you have to do is once we have this slice of bytes uh, in the control message is parsing it. Um, and fortunately, there, the Unix packaging Go actually has a, has a nice parse con uh, soccer control message for us that we can sort of sift through and eventually decode the timestamp information from the kernel and the network card. Uh, it was a bunch of... All of this was had to be reverse engineered from the Linux source code to get the the structs and the the array bounds to get the proper information out of out of those control messages. Fortunately, uh, 
I did most of the work for you. Um, you can use this fast AF packet uh, Go package, which implements the net packet con and uses the socket library that I mentioned before under the hood. Um, and it sets up the AF packet and the socket option timestamping options for you. Um, and it also offers convenient methods for receiving um, outgoing packet timestamps and incoming packet timestamps. Um, and a basic setup is this example below is binding directly to a network interface um, for raw sockets for all protocols if you want. And then you can even apply uh, eBPF filters to it to only, to only handle uh, the right packets that you want. So for using this for packet sending and receiving, uh, you can uh, think about ranging over a certain time frame, and this encode packet is some function that takes the source MAC IP and, des and port, the destination MAC IP and port, and the data that you actually want to send out, and encodes all those layers for you. Um, and then you just call write to uh, on that connection, send the packet out, and then you specify the actual hardware address, the network card that you want to send that data out. Um, you would then have uh, an asynchronous uh, go routine listening in the background to receive outgoing timestamps and you would get the packet back. And then there's a, a one of the options is this TS, which is a timestamp struct, which will give you the hardware and the software timestamps of that outgoing packet. And if we log those out, we could see those timestamps are below. Um, and then from packets that are coming in from the outside world, into the into the network card, we get the same uh, same result. So we call this receive RX timestamps. We get the packet, and we get the additional timestamp information for the hardware and the software. This example shows if we do uh, a simple subtract subtraction from the hardware time from the current time that we're actually executing this line, we see a difference of 423 microseconds. So that tells us that. Technically, the packet came into the network card 423 microseconds in the past, even though we got the packet on this line in our Go process and user space. So what can I do with this information? Well, um, we can measure one-way latency from a very specific network card A to another network card B and do asymmetric measurements because a to B measurement might be actually different from B to A, depending on the paths that these packets take across an, a given network, they might be asymmetric. So if you want to know the difference between the source and destination bef uh, out and back, uh, you can actually pull that information out. Um, the, ping, uh, the ping program that we're all used to actually does um, two way. So the measurement that you get is both forward and back, but you can actually get a single direction with this if you want to. Um, you can do some observability into time being spent in processing packets. So you can understand at the kernel level how long it's being taken in and out. And even in the network queues, how long packets are being spent in those queues in and out. Um, as I illustrated before, uh, we can get wire only times so we can subtract the kernel and network timestamps from the user space times that we get and we can literally get the latency from wire nick to nick if we want those and because of that this actually removes the jitter that's introduced from context switching both in the go runtime and the host operating system and also finally the the nick queues as it's you know sitting in the buffers to come in and out um, and we could sp target specific nicks here too um, traditionally, when you do a, a, a listen or, or a bind, you're going to just bind on an IP and a port um, and then leave it up to the OS or the Go runtime to sort of decide what, what network card it's going to bind to. Um, using this package, it actually lets you specify a dedicated NIC. So you might have a server with multiple network cards and you only want to measure and send packets in and out of a specific one. Um, so you can use this and listen to all of the network cards um, and have a go routine for each one. And this will let you identify, you know, potentially a, snow, a slow NIC queue, or maybe the, the kernel is spending 
too much time interfacing with the specific uh, NIC queue as well. Um, and you can identify those bottlenecks if you need to. Um, so again, getting those timestamp delays that, uh, uh, that we want to measure and keep track of is taking the software time and we subtract the user space time, we're going to get the outgoing kernel delay. And the hardware time outgoing is going to give us the outgoing NIC delay. And then on the reverse side incoming, we can get the kernel and NIC delays as well. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things that we can do with these measurements. <laughs> um, the caveat here is that timestamping support uh, should work in the in the kernel, and the documentation does support um, what versions of the kernel has it. Um, hardware timestamping is dependent on the actual hardware itself. Um, I know for a fact that I've used uh, Mellanox NICs in the past that do have that support. Uh, if you're curious about it. You can use the ETH tool to check your own hardware. Um, you could do this on your laptop if you have a, a Linux machine. Chances are you're you're going to get software support, but you might not get hardware support because commodity um, commodity hardware on laptops might have might not have hardware support for timestamping. Um, so the for, sort of Further reading based on all these topics, there's the AF packet and the so timestamping documentation from the, the kernel documentation. Um, I would encourage everybody to read the one way delay uh, paper links in there. Um, because we're dealing with one way delay, it does assume that the, that the servers that you're speaking to, A and B, um, know the true time and agree on a time. So that's where clock and time synchronization actually comes into play using it, something like NTP. Um, as we all know, clock and time sync can be relatively difficult to achieve in a physics-based world. Um, but the best we can do is, is leveraging these tools to get that and at least identify um, how to measure these one-way delays. Um, and so, like I said, we've, we've used this in the past to sort of measure um, network cards to other network cards in a in a controlled network um, to sort of understand what the what the health of the network looks like, where servers need to actually live in relation to their uh, to their users, um, and it's definitely exposed some very interesting um, you know scenarios on our, where we had to address network delay and lag, and uh, even hardware failures as well. Um, that's all I have for you today. I hope this sort of exposes a, a new world of sort of lower level networking in the Go ecosystem, especially. Uh, traditionally, it's not really that much low level, but um, because Go has always been very ergonomic to work with, especially in the networking world, um, it felt like a nice fit to sort of uh, work with these packages and get really deep into the lower level networking pieces while still having the ergonomics of a of a higher level language like Go, um, as opposed to doing this in like C or C++. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you can always reach out to me in, in any fashion. I'm Blaine Smith on all the social networks, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, or GitHub or anything like that. You can reach out to me and I'll see if I can answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.